welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. You know what Christy Matthewson wor- wasn't worried about? S-I-E-R-A. When you're thinking about Pedro Siriaco, I mean, the only one that can compete is maybe uh, Hannes Wagner's 1908 season. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Kern. Like, if we just clip together every time we've talked about him on other people's profiles, we've done a Mickey Cochran episode. I can't get past Rabbit Marinville. It's, you know, it's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio, where we're talking baseball kind of whenever. I'm your host, Chris Gianta. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing pretty well. We skipped the uh, the midweek show this week because we had obligations at school, but we got a pretty loaded episode today on this Sunday night with the Braves crushing the Cubs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, usually the, you know, our, our mid, our in-season episodes thus far have been like 40 minutes each. So we'll just make today, you know, over an hour and that'll probably just make up for, uh, make up for the lack of episode like earlier, earlier in the week. But yeah, there is a lot to go over. You know, a lot can happen over the full week and uh we're very glad we're very glad that things did happen um i guess we'll start where we'll start on the south side where on was it tuesday uh yes Um, tuesday or wednesday something like that sometime in the middle slash beginning of the week uh carlos rodon tosses a no hitter second no hitter by a pitcher this year uh in uh you know he retired the first 25 batters hits the 26 and gets number 27 and 28 out uh very very cool story cool uh performance just very very interesting on all fronts yeah i mean it was it was a bigger story going in because it was a perfect game up until the ninth inning, uh, he gets the first out, and the second batter was Roberto Perez, and uh, a slider got away with it, got away from him, and it ended up hitting him on the on the leg. And uh, Perez didn't actually make any effort to get out of the way of it, so there was some Jose Tabata controversy there. Uh, I don't think it was as serious though. He didn't lean in; he just didn't make an effort to get out of the way. Yeah. So that was unfortunate. And either way, it ended up being a no hitter, which is very cool. Even though I will say. The strike three call to Yu Chang in the ninth inning, not a strike. I don't know um, if you caught that, Chris. Not a strike at all. Yeah, that was a that was like a little inside, right? That yes, they, it was very inside. It um, wasn't even particularly close. It definitely landed inside. I, it did have horizontal movement where you could say there's an argument maybe it crossed over, but it definitely landed a lot, a lot inside. I mean, if you want to take a look at this, if you see on YouTube that that red pitch right there that was the last pitch and that was a called strike okay yeah yeah if you want to check out the youtube iteration of this episode you can see where that last pitch was it was not in the strike zone yeah it it definitely when i saw that i was like uh that was that was kind of a gift yeah um and yeah this is a guy you know they talked about he uh has had a big injury history he only pitched seven and two thirds last year and what what happened? Did he get non-tendered or something? Yeah, so he had soldier surgery. He had Tommy John surgery. He had he had an elbow problem. He had a lot of just different injuries on his upper half, particularly with his arm area. Uh, and he got DFA'd, I believe. Um, yeah, at some point he got DFA'd. So he's obviously been through a lot. I mean, he was just a guy fighting to be in the rotation, which is already pretty loaded with guys like, Giolito, Lynn, Keiko, like he was just fighting for a spot in this rotation and he has done a very, very good job. And the no hitter is certainly going to cement that, that spot for him in the long-term future of the season. Uh, Yeah. um, Yeah. He's in a very competitive situation with, you know, the White Sox have one of the best rotations in the American league. And uh, you know, it wasn't just this particular start where he did, well, I mean, he hasn't given up a run all season. He's, no. This was his, uh, this was his second start. I'm looking at the game logs here. Um, 
Yeah, his first game, it was five five scoreless innings, nine strikeouts was his, uh, was his first game. So, yeah, uh, pretty, you know, maybe a, a guy to look out for this year. And, yeah, he, you know, his fastball velocity was was rising throughout the game. That was pretty crazy, crazy to see. I didn't know this particular guy had, you know, 98, 99 in him. But uh, especially on a very cold night where it's hard to do that. Yeah. Uh, he uh, he really performed and was really up to the challenge. Yeah, there's been a lot of general concern around the Indians offense. You know, I mean, they had it last year and they give away Lindor. And they were, I will say, I actually had a, I had a lot of confidence in the Indians on this game, particularly coming into the night because Zach Plesak was pitching. I thought he was very good. The Indians won, I think, like six of their last eight coming into this game, and now they're 500. So, like, this was this game was kind of a turning point uh, on their young season so far as well. All right, yeah. Um, any any uh, any particular thoughts on the uh, Roberto Perez being hit? Any uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's kind of just it's very there's a lot of gray area with with uh, leaning into pitches and not making an effort because like, I don't, can you really say it's reviewable? Like, can we make it reviewable to, to, to see if a guy got made an effort to get out of the way? Like, I feel like that's very objective and it's not really something that's like, you know, it's, it's a set, like you either did or you didn't. Like, I feel like there's a lot more gray area to that. Yeah. I mean, uh, personally, like I have no problem with, someone not moving at all because it's like yeah. you're there it doesn't matter where the ball went obviously it's not, like, it's not like he was crowding the plate either like he was a perfectly reasonable uh at a personally re- perfectly reasonable spot i mean it's not like he was being obnoxiously very close to the plate where he was taking up the entire inside part of the zone like he was at a decent spot and it's not like you know he he threw one just inside that happened to get him yeah it's yeah it's not like he his elbow was like over the inside corner and it's not like Wilson Contreras against the Brewers. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't like that whatsoever. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, and even Rodon pointed it out. Like the guy doesn't really have to, doesn't really have to move in the box. I yeah. mean, especially, especially a guy who wasn't really over the plate at all. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's why the perfect game is so hard. It is like I mean, it's literally one pitch gets away, and that's the whole thing. Yeah, I mean that was Joe Musgrove, except it happened in the in the fourth. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I mean, like I don't know, he he didn't make any effort, but it's not like he made an effort to get hit. Yeah, exactly. Like it's- Jose Tabata made an effort to get hit against Max Serger in 2015. Roberto Perez just did not move a muscle during that pitch. So I mean, I think I have less of a problem with that. Yeah, right, right, like, right. Like, obviously, you don't want to you don't want to get perfect gamed, even if you're an established catcher on this team who has a future. Regardless, like you don't want to you don't want to be in that spot. Yeah, exactly. And the Indians players were probably his his teammates were probably somewhat happy with that happening, the way it did. Um, but uh, what do we want to get into first? Do we want to talk about the Jay Bruce just retiring? Yeah. yeah mid-season honestly i mean i i kind of respect it like he it's not like he left anything on the table but i mean he was obviously struggling this year for the yankees and uh he decided to hang it up yeah i mean yeah this was a guy who you know was not supposed to be starting playing any significant role on the yankees until luke voigt got injured and luke voigt you know this is one of the first years where he's like the established first baseman of the Yankees. So there's really not much behind him, but he got hurt and they bring in Jay Bruce, who is was uh, primarily an outfielder during the, during his prime as well. Yeah. And known for known for home run hitting and being able to be, you know, service serviceable offensively. This year, he was hitting 118 with a 466 OPS. You know, he's uh, 34, which I guess is maybe a bit young for retirement, but it's kind of a common age to mm-hmm. retire at. And, like, you know, this was 
uh, you know, him getting him getting kind of his last shot. It, it seemed like, you know, in uh, he was on the Phillies last year, had a 90 OPS plus, which is below average, which is not good. That was just, were, yeah. When you were uh, primarily valuable offensively. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, I mean, 2019, I remember him being pretty good, but he had a 101 OPS plus. He was literally the fractions above average. Yeah, it's just he had that. He was a part of that great start in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, he was a very good home run hitter. Um, I guess it just kind of hurts the Yankees because now they're now they have even less depth at the first base position, but based on what he was doing, didn't seem like, didn't seem like very much. Yeah. I mean, they've already had to go out and get Rugnet Odor out of desperation. Uh, now you got to add a first base, a hole to that. I'm not sure when Luke Voigt is exactly due back. I want to say it's like June or something like that. So they still got a lot of time and uh, I mean, they need it now. Like that Voigt injury has really proved to be more detrimental than any of us could have imagined. Yeah, it, it has, you know, he was one of the, you know, outside of LeMahieu last year was the most valuable uh, player of that offense. And arguably since 2019, he's been, you know, second most valuable player of that offense. Exactly. So, yeah. um, you have a, you have more on Jay Bruce, though, him. like I, one thing I'll remember about Jay Bruce is that he was kind of an icon in the state of Ohio, if you really think about it. He spent a lot of time on the Reds. I think his most iconic thro- moment, moment throughout of his, his career was in 2010. He had a walk-off home run that won the division for the Reds. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I be- was Did he uh, hit like a walk-off home run in his debut? Or was, that, o- was that only uh, Miguel Cabrera who did that? That was Miguel Cabrera for sure. I'm not sure if Jay Bruce did it. I mean, that definitely wasn't his uh, debut. Uh, I mean, I could check if he homered in his first at bat. I don't think he did. But then anyway, going back to my point, you know, he was obviously an icon in Cincinnati. He was there for forever. Uh, He homered in his fifth game career. Um, You know, he was there for nine years, had a 110 OPS plus, hit 233 home runs for the Reds. Um, I want to say he might be uh, like on their all-time wins above replacement leaderboard too. Uh, That's a very old franchise. Probably not. Yeah, he's not, but he's close. Um. The number 24 had 30 wins for the Reds. He had 17. Eh, see, it wasn't that close. But either way, I mean, he was obviously a franchise icon there. He had a five-win season in 2013. And then he went to the Indians later on in his career after a brief uh, stint with the Mets. And he he was only in Cleveland for one year, half of a year. And it was the it was the 22-game win streak season. And he hit a walk-off to win uh, one of those like later games in the streak. It was like 21 or 22 or something like that. Maybe it was 20. And um, beyond that, he ended up tying the ALDS game too, where after Lindor hit that grand slam, Jay Bruce ended up tying it. Yeah. And uh, I feel like he had a, a, a home run in the first game of that series too. Yeah, he did. Mistaken. Yeah. So he was a contributor uh, in that short series. Uh, my, yeah, his uh, his first career home run w- was a walk off. That's what I had confused. Okay, it was not in his debut, but it was his first career home run. Sure. Uh, so that was pretty. Cool. That was a moment to have, uh, with Cincinnati, but yeah, um, I just remember him, always. You know, he was a part of, part of those, Reds teams that were always like knocking on the door of, the postseason. You know, division winners in 2012. You know, it was, it was, you know, him and Votto in the middle of that order, hitting 30 home runs each. You know, Votto obviously was, you know, better getting on base, but Bruce was right there taking advantage of Great American Ballpark. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, very, uh, very cool to see. One thing I'm really noticing about Jay Bruce's um, legacies and all the places he played, it's, it's really a tale of two different – uh, states, if you will, because, you know, Ohio, he was a he was a hero for both teams. Then in New York, he was awful with the Yankees in 10 games. And then in the Met with the Mets uh, for parts of two different seasons, he was a part of or three different seasons, I should say. 
he was a part of that time they batted out of order. Wow. Which that's not his fault, but I mean, that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think Jay Bruce Mets. Yeah. Well, so well, was he just in the lineup or was, did he go up or did someone go up ahead of him? So Ostrubel Cabrera came up and hit a double in his batting spot. And then he came up in Ostrubel spot. And then uh, I forget who I want to, I think Jim Riggleman was the Mets man or the Reds manager at the time. Because this was when, um, this was right after uh, Brian Price got fired, or it was before Brian Price got fired. It was one of those two, you know, asked to check that, and they had bet it out of order. <laughs> so it wasn't Jay Bruce didn't actually do anything other than go up at the wrong time, and it wasn't his double that was erased, but he was just a part of that. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty wild how that happened. Yeah, part of part of a infamous day in Mets history for sure of which there are many <laughs> um so that's Jay Bruce um we will get into the Yankees struggles a little bit later uh but uh one thing we're gonna we got to talk about is you know we had so far most anticipated series of the regular season Padres Dodgers you know th- this was built up and uh, it, it paid off fantastically, even more than I expected it would. Every single game was great, all three of them. Yes. And for very different reasons. Like Friday, I think Friday was the consensus best game of the three. Uh, it helped that it was the only game going on for most of the exciting parts of it because it ended at 3 in the morning East Coast time. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you have you had so many iconic like, – Jerickson Profar tying the game with a two run double in the eighth. Like that was really when it started getting attention. You know, you have Tatis homering in one of his first at bats back earlier in the game. You have Justin Turner hitting the RBI single, the go ahead single in the ninth to which the Padres tied it on a fitting Eric Hosmer ground ball. Which, by the way, I mentioned this to Chris, but Manny Machado got on base with two outs. And I said, before Machado got up, I go, all right, Machado's going to walk here. And then Eric Hosmer is going to come up and hit a ground ball. And when I preface, I preface that to say he's going to ground out to end the game, of course. I said to second base, too. I might add. I will add. Is that he's going to ground one to second. And that was meant to say he'll ground one to second to end the game. Machado walks. He steals second base, takes third on a wild pitch. And then Eric Hosmer grounds one to second that just gets through and ties the game. So I was technically right with with my prediction. Not that it's not that it's takes a genius to predict Eric Hosmer is going to hit a ground ball, but it, it was still almost exactly as I said. Yeah. Just the uh mystic mystic Daniel right there. Um yeah. and yeah, that makes it a six six ball game and then two shutout innings with the two shutout innings from each team with the uh, runner at second rule, which is very hard to do. Yeah. Hard to do. And then, uh, what is it? It was like a first pitch single from Betts and then uh, like a first pitch homer from Corey Seager. No, no, no. It was just a, it was just a first pitch homer from Seager because Betts was the last out. And oh, the right, yeah. Because Betts flew out to center and then Seager came up and hit a first pitch home run to make it 8-6. Oh, yeah, made it 8-6. And then, uh, yeah, they scored three more, and then, then it got pretty wild. They brought in the Padres brought in Jake Cronenworth, their second baseman to pitch, who apparently pitched at Michigan, which I read about. I, I uh, it was like, oh my god, he pitched at Michigan because I remember he was one of my how about that's last year, and I noticed that. And uh, David Price came up and flew out to Joe Musgrove in left field. <laughs> Just amazing, and the, and the bench is cleared too. Oh, yeah. and it was like it was like the 25th man on both rosters as well. It yeah, was, yeah. It was Dennis Santana who hit Jorge Mateo. Uh, I feel bad too because Mateo got hit with a runner on third with one out. So I was like, as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, he's pissed. Like he just missed a, he just got Craig counseled. He missed an opportunity to walk it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The bench is cleared. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a pretty big part. I think the, the, I mean, just the funniest part that it was like the two most unrecognizable guys on each team that the the argument was about. 
Yeah, this was not Veritech and A-Rod. This no, was, it was not Veritech and A-Rod. It wasn't like Bueller Dennis. versus Tatis. It was Dennis Santana versus Jorge Mateo. Yeah, wasn't wasn't Manny versus Clemens. It was, uh, you know, they're like fifth right-handed pitcher out of the bullpen and a utility outfielder. Neither guy were on the postseason rosters last year. Yep. <laughs> when they face each other. They have no idea what the beef is really like between these teams, and they were just going at it. Yeah, and uh, I guess that transitions into the next game where there was, like, uh, no, it wasn't Mateo, but Profar and Kershaw were – yeah, they were, we're, ta- they were talking were in the fourth as well. Yeah. Uh, Profar s- strikes out. He was a mile late on this fastball, was definitely expecting something else. And uh, he, like, it was a weird swing, if we're being honest. And it hit Will Smith's glove. He makes the argument for catcher's interference. And uh, Kershaw's yelling at Profar saying, you know, that was not – that's not a uh, regular swing that you did. You know, it was kind of, I don't know if he was implying if it was on purpose or if it was just a dumb swing. And, uh, you know, Profar eventually got the, got the catcher's interference call under further review. But that was a pretty interesting thing to watch, especially, you know, when, a, when it's a guy as legendary as Kershaw doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And yeah, Kershaw and Darvish dueled it out. Uh, Darvish gave up his run on a walk to Clayton Kershaw, which is a lot of weird stuff. I think he, I think he got the first two outs of that inning, if I'm not mistaken. And then he gave yeah, up. Yeah, he did. Of, he gave up a walk, single walk, walk. Yeah, it was. And the rest of his outing was fine. Like he went seven innings strong. Or I think he might have hit a guy. And then, yeah, two walks and a single. Yeah, he had a he had a very good outing. It was, yeah, I think seven innings, one run, a bunch of strikeouts. And Kershaw went, I think, six shutout or seven shutout, something like that. Yeah, he did. And uh, pretty uneventful up until the ninth inning. I think the Do- Dodgers got an insurance run to make it 2 nothing. Yeah, Justin Turner had a home run. Justin Turner really climbed the, uh, the F4 leaderboards this yep, week, by and- the way. Like he's he should be he's probably gonna end up yeah, being the week. Right, right, and uh, eventually, uh, it's first, first and second. They got Victor Gonzalez on the mound, uh, get trying to get the save, and uh, who? Wait, who was who hit that ball in the, the two outs? First and second. Tommy Pham. Tommy Pham hits one to right center field. It's coming down fast, but Mookie Betts makes a diving catch. I thought I thought it popped out of his glove for a second when I first saw it. Yeah, I knew it was going to have to be put under review. Yeah, he I caught mean, it might right, as well. He caught it right in his palm, and it looked like that baseball was, like, mm-hmm. cutting blades of grass. But mm-hmm. if you have control of it, that's where, like, the NFL I was going to say, there aren't as many catch controversies in baseball as football. Yeah. This is where the NFL rules come in. I was say, if it was the NFL, that would have been a drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, he, uh, yeah, he caught it. He had control of it. He got both feet in bounds, and uh, Dodgers win. Yeah, yeah, Dodgers won that one. And then Sunday, Bauer versus Snell. Uh, sir, I don't know if you would categorize this as a uh, pitcher's duel, but both did very well. Bauer went six innings, one run. Snell went, I think, five innings, two runs. And, but Padres came in, came through late. They uh, tied the game in the eighth, and then did they tie the game in the eighth and then take the lead? Uh, yeah, they did both in the same inning. Yeah, four run eighth inning. Or no, 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 no. I think they they took the lead and expanded it in one inning. All right, we'll go to the. Yeah, they scored one in the seventh, three in the eighth. Okay, yeah. So it was tied two to two, and uh, they scored three in the eighth and uh, made it five to two. And the bullpen for them held it down, and they won the game five to two. Getting a nice win. Wouldn't have want. Wouldn't have wanted to get swept there. Swept there. So what are our? 
do we have like any overall takeaways from this series? I think my main takeaway was that like this, these teams found a way to make the extra inning rule really enjoyable. Like, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I was sitting, I was sitting in my bed at like two 40 in the morning in the 12th. I was like, Manfred was right. <laughs> I was like, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Like every, like every single time it's like, okay. I mean, I guess it's much easier to be in to, for it to be intense when you go four consecutive half innings with no run scoring and it's, you know, it's automatically high pressure situations like Tim Hill uh, struck out Austin Barnes in the 11th for the second out of the inning. And he was going crazy on the mound. Like that's for the second out. You don't see that unless it's the third out ever. Yeah. Cause that, that guy on third is so much less valuable when there's two outs because there's no sack flies exactly. that are in a, that are in effect. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I think this rivalry to, or this, uh, series to me solidified that there is an actual rivalry it's not yeah. just fabricated on the like there was you could feel the legit like tension and animosity between the teams yeah i mean it seemed like all these games were being played like it was uh, october maybe not yeah. managed but played exactly um and i i will say i mean like, we got it next weekend as well yeah we get it uh this time in los angeles yep and you know Obviously, there's probably going to be some good pitching matchups as well. I, mean, I think I'd say everything went as expected. Like they were all really tight games, uh, and the Dodgers ended up being the better team in the series. They won two games. The Padres won one. Yeah, and I mean, like both teams, like the Padres had their chances on Friday. Like Tatis came up with the bases loaded uh, to walk it off, and he ended up striking out looking on a pitch on a curve right down the middle that he was obviously not sitting on. Yeah, yeah, they they definitely had their chances. You know, both teams had their chances in the tenth and eleventh. But yeah, you know, after after your pitching staff holds the uh, other team scoreless in you know that in those extra innings where there's a guy on second, it's like all right, it's our time now. It's a very different feeling than it probably used to be, but didn't execute there. So I guess that. Uh, wraps up that um so there's been there's been a particular pitcher who has just been out of this world amazing who you know last year he did get Cy Young votes but overall not a household name by any stretch who's just been carving it up once again this uh this season and uh I think we have to we have to acknowledge this because this is, this is, these are, this guy is not one of our how about that players that we're going to mention later, but he needs to have his own segment after what he's done through three starts. I have some pretty ridiculous numbers on Corbin Burns. First of all, he has made three starts. He's one and one with an 0 490 RA, I think. Yeah. He, his first outing of the year was that, was that, um, pitchers duel with Barrios where they both took no hitters into the seventh. And he ended up giving up a home run to Byron Buxton. That is the only uh, run that he's given up this year. He's pitched 30 innings. He straight up has not walked a single person. He has allowed four hits, one run, and no walks in 30 innings pitched. Yeah. I mean, the, the 30 strikeouts to no walks is just mind-boggling. Maybe, maybe it's not 30 innings then. I think it's like 18 innings, actually. 18 I, mixed up, I mixed up the 30 uh, between innings and strikeouts. Yeah, 18 yeah, he, 18, 18 and, and a third three. innings pitch, 30 strikeouts, no walks. He leads the league in FIP with an 092, whip with a 218, hits per nine with two, walks per nine with obviously zero. I can't imagine what his FIP would be had he not given up that home run. Yeah. 30 strikeouts. No like if walks. it was just a single instead. Yeah, if it was just a single, you know, yeah, he'd have a 0, 0, 0 ERA and uh, a negative one FIP something like that like yeah so i'm just gonna go over a few quick numbers on corbin burns so far because it's just been it's he's already having a historic season beyond belief so first yeah. of all if you don't know what game score is it's a metric created by bill dreams to just basically uh sum up a person's start uh where it starts at 50 and it goes up and down depending on like your walks your hits your earned runs your innings pitched and i think those are the four uh statistics that it that takes into account 
Um, so with that being said, Corbin Burns has a game score of 78 in each of his first three starts. And he is the first pitcher to have three game scores of 78 or higher in his team's first 15 games of the season since Pedro Martinez and Kurt Schilling both did it in 1998. So that's, I mean, that's a crazy company to be in. And he is the first pitcher in MLB history to have three starts with nine plus strikeouts, two or less hits, zero walks, and less than innings, seven innings pitched in a season. He's the first person to do that three times in a season, and it's only been three starts. And with that being said, he had one of those starts last year. So his four starts with nine plus strikeouts, two or less hits, zero walks, and less than seven innings pitched are the most all time. So Corbin Burns has just been extremely impressive so far for the Milwaukee Brewers, and he goes again on Tuesday. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy who has stuff where, like, you know, no reason why he can't be com competing for Cy Youngs, and he's only 26. You know, I mean, this this guy could be one of the best pitchers uh, of the future as well as the present. It's wild. Exactly. And just guy came out of almost nowhere. I mean, fourth fourth rounder in 2016. I'm trying to see if if he was ever like top 100 prospect. Let's uh, take a look. He was number, you know, the number 69 prospect in Major League Baseball on MLB's on MLB's list in uh, 2018 before the 2018 season, but like not crazy top of the line. And he's just coming out here. He's made some adjustments and right now is looking like one of the best pitchers in baseball. Absolutely. Pretty, pretty wild to see uh, where a guy just kind of comes up out of nowhere, um, even though he had a good year last year, of course. Um, but anyway, on to guys that are not doing particularly well. The Yankees have the worst record in the American League. And they've lost eight of their last 10, five in a row. What's going on in the Bronx here? You know, it's weird, Chris, because usually when a team is struggling, there's an easy thing to point to. That doesn't exactly exist with the Yankees. Like, I think the, the biggest argument you can make is the rotation behind Gar outside of Garrett Cole. And that's valid. They haven't, they haven't really been uh, – they really haven't been picking up the pace uh, as much as you'd like them to. But with that being said, the rotation entering today as a whole, uh, I mean, they had a 494 ERA, but they had 1132 or 11.32 strikeouts per nine, which uh, is second in the American League to the Angels. So it um, is very weird. So they have a fit, but their walks are pretty bad. Or their, their home runs are pretty bad. I'm sorry. Wait, what, what stat were they second in? I'm sorry. Strikeouts per nine. Strikeouts per nine. Um, but I, guess, like, I guess that doesn't exactly automatically mean they're good, but they also are getting BABIP to death. They have a 318 BABIP against this season, uh, which is fifth in the league and, interesting. Second, in the, and second in the AL. Um, their, their offense does not look like it Great. should. No. Uh, I've got some stats on their offense from April 7th to April 17th, which is yesterday as of this recording because I can't confirm rankings based on stats through Sunday because those aren't out yet on fan graphs. So from seven, April 7th to April 17th, the Yankees had the third worst OPS and the worst batting average in baseball. That's mm -hmm. over a nine game stretch. And uh, on Sunday, their OPS and average both dropped uh, from those, from those numbers. So, you know, you, when this comes out, the, the rankings are probably worse, you know, not with batting average because it's already the worst, but with OPS, it could be worse. So in their last 10 games, they're hitting 194 with a 572 OPS. That's pretty, pretty bad. Um, you know, I guess they are facing the Rays. Uh, Who they just can't handle. They're just, yeah, it's been really bad. Uh, and individually, John Carlos Stanton, including today where he hit the home run, he is hitting 171 with a 559 OPS. Uh, Aaron Hicks, including today in this 10 game span, hitting 200 with a 545 OPS. And Glaber Torres, 
the Oriole Killer, hitting 161 with a 510 OPS since April 7th, which is where the Yankees uh, got out to a three and two record. Now they're five and ten. So ever since then, those guys are are doing that. And there's one man, one man who has been worse than all of them, who will be my slightly alarming. So I'm gonna tease that. Save that. Uh, uh, I'm my my guess is it's probably someone in the three hole. Three hole. No, I think I mentioned the three hole guy. Okay. Oh, you you mentioned Hicks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I was I was looking for some numbers. It's my bad. Um, yeah, no, Hicks yeah. has got to get out of that three hole, man. I don't know what he's doing there. And I guess uh, my my suggestion was put Gary Sanchez there, but he's been struggling ever since he homered in his first two games. I think he is. Uh, I think he is the 18th worst slugging out of all of like the the, the 200 hitters with 100 plate appearances since uh, the third game of the season. Yeah, it's um, I mean, it's hard to put anybody in the middle of the order deservedly at this point. Yeah, I mean, and really, the only guy. I mean, Aaron Judge has been really slumping too. Like his OPS went from one thousand to like mid eight hundreds, like this weekend alone. Yeah, and he's still been one of their better guys because exactly. the rest of the team has been so bad. Like it's basically just. And by the way, the bullpen has been fantastic as well. Yeah, very like weird. They far and away have the best bullpen in baseball this year, like statistically speaking. So like you can't point to them. Entering entering Sunday, they had a 1.5 bullpen F4. The next best was 1.1 in the majors. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty insane. Yeah, because you have – with the Yankees, you have LeMahieu at the top usually and then Judge following him. But, you know, after that, it's – Also, LeMahieu has been, like, not great with runners in scoring position, which is, like – which is one of the biggest reasons why they signed him to that deal in the offseason. Yeah, that's – Pretty let me, interesting. Let me look at it because I checked it out recently. I know he got a, an RBI single yesterday, but he got one. Yeah, he got one on Sunday. Okay. I mean, he's been okay, but it's not what it's supposed to be. He's with runners in scoring position. He's slashing 273, 467, 273, 739. So a lot of walks, but he hasn't gotten an extra base hit yet. Interesting, but I guess you're not really looking for extra base hits, with, especially from your leadoff hitter with runners in scoring position. I wouldn't say it's uh alarming yet based on the fact that it's been 15 games for them but you know if, at, for, with the yankees you're taking what you're getting mm-hmm. that's why like you know there's some guys that have been okay that i you know didn't point out in the in the with with their stats because some of the other guys have been so bad but yeah, yeah. It, the offense just uh not quite the same. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure in this 10 game span, it started with a series against the Rays and ended with a series against the Rays. Yeah, they've lost 18 out of 23 against the Rays, right? Yep. It, <laughs> like, weird. I wonder if there's anything specific that. And not only that, but like some of the wins, like they kind of shouldn't have had. Like the one time they've beaten the Rays this year was a week from a week ago today, last Sunday, where they won in extras. Uh, like, it was a game that the Rays kind of let, let slip away from them. So, like, even the games they're winning, it's not like they're winning convincingly. Yeah. So, yeah, they uh, dropped two out of three against the Rays uh, last weekend, and then this – or, you know, last, last weekend, and then this past weekend got swept by them. Uh, yeah. It might be just – that particular rotation and combination of rotation and bullpen can just get these guys out. But I don't know, even the Yankees, you know, they dropped two out of three against the, against the blue Jays too. Let me ask you this. Do you think it's time to hit the panic button on this team? Um, They're four and a half games out of the division. Luke Voigt's not going to be back for another probably month and a half. Uh, I would say, I don't know. It, it's hard to say, you know, we're, we're halfway through the first month out of six in the season. I'm looking at their upcoming schedule. Um, so they got two against Atlanta. You probably expect like a split there that, that just naturally happens. Then you got four against Cleveland, four against uh, Baltimore, and then three against Detroit, and then you got Houston. So, okay, let's see. When, when would it be time to 
uh, hit the panic button because Cleveland, I think if they, they you said they're facing Detroit, they're facing Cleveland, Baltimore, and Detroit in an eleven game span. Eight of them oh, on the facing, road. They're facing the Braves too, right? Yeah, Braves. So after the Braves, you got Indians, Orioles, Detroit. I'd say if they lose, are they playing six against De- uh, Orioles in Detroit? Uh, they're playing seven combined. Seven combined. Okay, I'd say if they lose four of those seven, it's it's panic button time. Definitely. For and, that's, sure. I mean, that's assuming that they also don't fare well against the Braves or the Indians. Because the yeah. Braves, I mean, I know the Braves have been struggling too, but I mean, they lit up Kyle Hendricks tonight. So that's probably going to be a, a game changer for them. And they yeah. got, who do they got going on Tuesday? They announced they have Charlie Morton going. So they're kind of getting the meat of that rotation. Yeah, they got Anderson Wednesday. I think it looks like it's a two game series. And they got four against Cleveland. Yeah. So, I mean, they're getting Shane Bieber this weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, in so against Atlanta, Cleveland, Baltimore, and Detroit combined, that's 13 games. So, I mean, if in those 13 games they go like six and seven, I'm not too worried. But yeah, if Baltimore, I think it ultimately, yeah, I think it really, I think we're really going to see a lot during the Baltimore Detroit series because if we're being honest, they should win all seven of those games. Yeah, like. It's definitely hard to do that, but you. you it's hard to do, up. but I mean, like six or seven, like okay, one maybe gets away. Five out of seven, a little bit of pushing it, but I mean, if they lose four of those seven, we got problems in New York. You you should expect to win five out of seven at yeah. least, uh, and then like yeah, if you have a losing record, definitely panic button time. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's time yet. I mean, like granted. This time next week, they could be in first in the division if if everything goes some crazy way. Yeah, if they if they find a way to turn it around. Um, all right. So the Yankees, just uh, not not with us <laughs> quite yet. So now we get into uh, some of the things we've teased previously in the in the episode. Uh, it's time for our. It's time for our Monday, April 19th, 2021 edition of How About That? So uh, who do you have to highlight in the How About Um, That today? So the guy I'm highlighting was involved in a pretty big trade last year. Uh, Came up as a a reasonably touted prospect in a pretty uh, stacked system. And has been producing for a team that has been outperforming expectations. I'm talking about Ty France the third baseman for this or uh, infielder for the Seattle Mariners. Uh, after a big day that he had today on the year, he is slashing 305, 400, 525, 925. He's in the two hole for the Mariners. He had a big day today with a home run and a double to win the series against the Astros. And after this day, his weighted runs created plus went from 141 to 166. So wow. he is sitting pretty with a 160 OPS or weighted runs created plus right now. And he is really leading the Mariners to what is currently tied for the best record in the American League. So Ty France is my guy. Yeah, he was a guy uh, who was intriguing last year. He did pretty well in their short in his short stint in Seattle, and mm-hmm. is uh, paying off well for the for the Pilots. For the Pilots. For the Pilots. Yeah. Uh, my how about that is uh, definitely not a. Definitely not an emerging guy. Definitely not a newcomer. Definitely not a guy you've never heard of. He's 38, and he's behind the plate for your St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah. Talking about Yadier Molina. I was I was very close to going with him. I mean, look, this guy. This guy just out of nowhere, just becoming an offensive machine, at least for the first for his first 14 games of the year. Uh, he's hitting 340 with a 1022 OPS right now. Uh, he has hit safely in 12 of his last 13 games. And on Saturday, he went three for five with two home runs and four RBI. When was and the last time he had a two home run game? I, I have no idea. If that I'm was his first that one, <laughs> if that was his first one, I wouldn't be that surprised. But it is one of two games by a catcher 38 or older. With two plus home runs, three plus hits, and four plus RBI, uh, the other guy 
It was Carlton Fisk. And he did that when he was 43. And insane. <laughs> but yeah. And uh, Yadier Molina's 12 games with a hit thus far makes him the first catcher 38 or older since Al Todd in 1940 to have 12 games with a hit in their team in their team's first 15 games. Whoops. So, uh, unfortunately, my search wasn't as eventful as I hoped. His last two home run game was August 27th of 2019 against the Brewers. Yeah, I mean, just a, just a power, just a, yeah, an electric factory in terms of power. I mean, he had two of them in 2018 as well. I think uh, I should do a little research into where he ranks among catchers in the MLB right now, because I would assume he probably leads them in like OPS, uh, just a quick imagine. little, just a quick little fan graphs. And, you know, there's not many qualifying catchers as it is. No, I guess uh, Contreras leads in wins above replacement. Uh, but I mean, they both have 0. 0.7, but we both know there's some extra decimals. Yeah. Contreras has a better OPS, but, Outside of Wilson Contreras, still, uh, still, uh, Molina. Contreras is supposed to be a good offensive catcher. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, outside of Contreras, Yadier Molina has the best OPS among qualified catchers, but uh, he does lead in a uh, batting average amongst qualified catchers, which I know these fans in St. Louis would love. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, Yadier Molina just looking – pretty crazy right now 38 is the new 28 yeah i mean entering his prime if you ask me yeah uh so after highlighting some of the some of the best players going right now we got to highlight some of the worst players going right now so here is our monday april 19th 2021 edition of slightly alarming so who do you got for slightly alarming so my slightly alarming has isn't particularly bad. I mean, he's certainly not what we've what we hoped for him, but this is a guy who has never had more to play for in his life. And he hasn't exactly been doing what he was supposed to. And that's Trevor Story. Uh he is, I mean, he's got a one-way ticket out of Colorado as soon as possible. And he's got a big payday coming up this winter. And thus far this season, it's not been too impressive. He is slashing 271, 302, 373, 674. He only has five extra base hits on the season for, I believe, a 102 uh, ISO, which is not what everyone was hoping for out of him. I mean, this is a guy who obviously just needs to get out of Colorado as soon as possible. When I highlighted the Rockies, I literally said the number one reason to watch this team is to see who the suitor is for Trevor Story. And if he's going to perform like this, it's going to drop the value on a guy who's only going to be there for two months. And not only that, but you have to consider he's already going to have a bit of leverage against him with the fact that he's a Rocky so that he's going to be, you know, a Coors guy. And I know that sometimes that, that argument doesn't apply for everyone, but if you're on the Rockies, it's going to be used against you no matter what. So Trevor story has got to pick it up if he wants to get more value out of himself in July and in the off season. Yeah. Um, entering, entering uh, Sunday at a 64 OPS plus, which, you know, accounts for, the park factor which is a big deal mm-hmm. when you're a, a rocky so yeah not not good at all with uh trevor story and you know if you're a rockies fan you're definitely not happy because you want his value to be as high as possible once the uh trade deadline yeah, comes. i mean you're you're helping nobody here by not being good yeah exactly and uh my or, forgot to put in the uh Trevor story slightly alarming looking slightly alarming uh my player is a guy who I put as a player to player to look for uh on the uh on the Yankees Clint Frazier just looking pretty bad right now currently hitting 167 with a 472 OPS he has a 240 woba which you know if you understand woba you know that's not very good definitely very, very bad, actually. Uh, but he's, you know, according to Baseball Savant, getting a little lucky. He has a 230 X Woba. So, you know, it's not like he's getting unlucky at all. And that's because he's been striking out a lot. Uh, in his last six games, this is also since the April 7th run uh, 
by the Yankees where they're where they've gone two and eight in his last six games he is one for 20 with 11 strikeouts <laughs> 11 strikeouts in uh 20 at bats not something you want to see you know he'll probably get out of it eventually it's just a matter of how quick and you know if you he's probably like you know the worst example of what the Yankees have been producing in this bad 10 game stretch. So Clint Frazier is looking slightly alarming. So those were our players to highlight for good and bad reasons. Now we'll get into a, uh, a little preview of the week ahead. Uh, what are you looking at in terms of series slash matchups to watch in the upcoming week? Uh, we sort of teased this series earlier. And it's it's we've already gone over it a little bit, but I'm still going to talk about it. I'm watching Braves Yankees. It's in it's only a two game series, but it's two teams that were at high expectations this season that have been struggling. The Braves are seven and nine. The Yankees are five and ten. Both teams need to get back on track, and they're going to have to use one of one another uh, to do so. On Tuesday, the Yankees haven't announced any of their starters, but the Braves are going to have Charlie Morton and Ian Anderson going in each of the games. And I think this series is going to say a lot about the team's struggles. Because, you know, it's they're both teams that are doing they're not doing as well as they were supposed to. And uh, one of them's I mean, unless they split the series, which is certainly possible and probably will happen, honestly. You know, but if it's a if it's a two game sweep, like one of these teams is going to be in big trouble. Um, yeah, that's uh, it is. Yeah, it is like kind of a test of two teams who should be doing better, who are not doing very well. So that is a, an interesting series to watch. Uh, for some reason, when I'm looking at series to watch, one that kind of intrigues me is Phillies Giants, um, just because they're two teams that started out pretty well. Um, I guess the Phillies have cooled off more than the Giants, but you know, no, you're not going to get great pitching matchups, but you're going to get probably a good amount of offense in this uh, three-game set between the Giants and Phillies. And uh, you'll kind of see where each team's at. And uh, I, I think it'll be pretty interesting to watch uh, just based off of, you know, the lineups that each of those two teams has. Absolutely. So uh, I think that closes the book on, uh, on the episode. So we hope you enjoyed this one. If you're late listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch, uh, watch us communicate, Go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. And you can find, you know, the playlists for uh, all the all the history series that we did. We put a lot of work into that. So, you know, those episodes are timeless. So always be, always feel the need or, you know, don't feel weird about going back and watching those. Uh, also, follow us on social media. Follow me on Twitter at Chris underscore Gianta and follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore current and follow the show Instagram at above replacement radio uh, for all the show updates. And we hope you enjoyed this one and we hope to see you. Uh, we definitely do hope to see you because it's not a guarantee in the middle of the week where we'll be uh, discussing all the events in baseball once again. So we will see you then. This conversation, this conversation is over. Is over. <laughs>